Greetings, friends. David Marks here with a fresh, updated version of a fundamental tutorial that I released many years ago. Today, I want to discuss how to use the exposure, blacks, white, shadows, and highlight sliders all over again, because a robust understanding of how these tools work in Lightroom is just essential. Without further ado, let me jump into my Lightroom catalog and let's get started. Today's tutorial focuses on these four sliders here in the middle of Lightroom Classic's basic panel. If you are working with the cloud-based version of Adobe Lightroom or one of the mobile apps, you'll find the same controls inside of the light panel. All six of the controls in this section of Lightroom change the luminance or brightness of our image. Now, the way that these sliders are laid out, you would think that you start with the exposure slider and then work your way down through this panel. After more than a decade of experience with Lightroom though, I have to tell you that that is not my recommended workflow. My advice is that you start out down here instead with the white and black sliders. As a general rule, we wanna move the white slider up to make the brightest parts of this image as close to paper white as possible without losing any meaningful detail. Watch how the brightest parts of this agave plant get brighter as I move this slider up. Moving this white slider up pushes the brightest tones toward paper white, which is wonderful. But if you go too far, you will eventually blow out some of the meaningful detail in the leaves. That's obviously too far. So I'll drop this slider back down to about 75. The opposite happens when I move the black slider to the left. Moving this one down makes the darkest parts of my original image even darker. If I drag this control too far, then I'll end up crushing all of the detail in the center of this plant. That looks pretty bad. So let's set this one back to about a reasonable setting. I'm gonna press the letter Y now on my keyboard to split the screen. Notice how the one on the left, our unaltered original, now looks flat and murky. What you're seeing here is the difference between a black and white image where we are using the full tonal range, where we have pixels that run from inky black all the way to almost paper white compared to one that does not. The image on the right, the after, where we fine tune the blacks and white sliders has way more contrast and more depth than the original. The additional snap that carefully moving these sliders brings to our images is not limited to black and white photos either. Watch what happens this time if I do the exact same thing on a color version of this photograph. Bam, see how much more snap this photo gets and how much more pop we get from all of the colors in this image? To understand why this magic is happening, we need to talk a little about the histogram. This is probably easier to understand at first if I hop back over to the black and white version of this photo for a minute. Now, I could talk your ear off on how to read a histogram, but here's the quick version. Histograms, this area up here, these are a bar graph that represent the number of pixels in our image at each different level of brightness. To read this bar graph, it really helps if we have labels on each axis. The y-axis, the vertical axis, is the easy one. The higher the spike rises on the y-axis, the more pixels that you have at that shade of brightness. Where the spike is lower, there are less pixels, and where the gray mass is absent, like it is right now, on the far left or right side, there are currently no dots at that level of luminance. So the Y is easy, but the X-axis, the horizontal axis, that's a harder one to understand. The X-axis represents the scale of brightness. On Lightroom's histogram, inky black is over there at the far left edge of the X-axis. Medium gray lives smack here in the middle, and paper white pixels are all the way over there on the far right side. When we look at that gray blob, which represents the distribution of pixels in this image by brightness right now, it's clear that the original image here, there were no pixels that were inky black and nothing near paper white either. When I move the blacks and white sliders up and down, what I'm really doing is pulling part of this image down towards pure black. That's what the black slider does. When I switch to the white slider, I'm pushing the brightest parts up towards paper white. Now, there are no rules in image processing, but in general, your image will never shine until you move the blacks and whites so that your image's tonal range, its distribution across that x-axis on the histogram, 
extends all the way from about the left edge on to the right edge. Let me show you another example. When I shot this photo, I was on one side of the valley and my friend, a professional skier, was over on the other. My friend Seth was committed to skiing off this 40-foot cliff. He'd been scoping this line all winter, but on the day when he finally said 3, 2, 1 dropping through our radios, I could barely see him through a fog cloud. The problem with fog is that it robs us of bright highlights and dark shadows. Fog gives us a world of low contrast, flat gray. Now, as I work on this image, please keep your eyes on the gray part of the histogram up there in the top right. When I shot this photo, I knew that it was going to be lousy, but watch what happens when I set the black slider way down. Now this image has some pixels that are near inky black. Next, I'm going to push the white slider way up so that we also have some pixels that are really close to paper white. What we need here are black pixels, not gray pixels, because Seth was wearing black snow pants. We need white pixels here because to the human eye, snow is white, almost paper white, and not a muddy gray. Moving these sliders remaps the values that my camera recorded to the tones that our eyes expect to see in a scene like this. I'm going to press the letter Y on my keyboard again because the results here are super dramatic. On the left is the original, where we have gray on gray. Without any contrast, without any separation between the whites, blacks, and grays, there's really nothing to see here. Once we spread that histogram out, though, once we fill up the tonal range, the fog disappears and our skier becomes visible. Now, this is still a lousy photo, but the results that we can get on any image using just these two sliders is pretty amazing. When I'm processing my images, I almost always use the blacks and white sliders first to make sure that I have some pixels at about inky black and some that are at about paper white. In the last example, I had to move these controls way further than usual. On a more typical image like this one, I only need to move these controls up or down a little to set my white point and my black point. And if you already have something at inky black or paper white, there's no rule that says you must move either of these controls at all. On this image, for example, I think I already have a black point. Things are already dark enough here, but the whites could be a little bit brighter. So I'm going to drag this one up to about plus 30. Once I've established the ends of the tonal scale using these two sliders, then it's time to work on the in-between values. When I move the shadow slider up, I'm taking some of the dark, but not the darkest pixels in this photo, and making them brighter. Think of the shadow slider like fill flash on your camera. In older versions of Lightroom, in fact, the predecessor to this tool was even named fill light. I used the shadow slider on almost every image to draw out detail that might otherwise be hidden in dark shadows. Highlights is similar, but it works on the other side of the tonal scale. Pulling the highlight slider down takes some of the brighter pixels in this image and moves them toward a darker value. When I press the letter Y to split the screen here, I hope that you can see what I mean by adjusting the in-between tones. Over there on the left, I had some pixels that were basically black and some that were pretty close to paper white in my original capture. When I moved the white slider and the black slider, I was fine tuning the absolute endpoints, but that alone is not enough to create a rich, detailed image. On the average image, we need to also carefully position the shadows and highlight sliders to establish the rough level of brightness that we want for all of our pixels everywhere throughout the image. If you learn nothing else from this tutorial, I beg of you, start with the blacks and whites and then carefully adjust your shadows and highlights. Only after I have done the best that I can with all four of these will I turn to the exposure and contrast controls up at the top. If I've done good work with the blacks, white shadows and highlights, then I usually do not need to move the exposure slider very far, if at all. A decimal difference here is usually all that it takes to make the overall image a touch brighter or a touch darker. There are, of course, exceptions to this rule. If you're working with an HDR image, for example, then you might need to move the exposure slider to a much larger or smaller value. Likewise, if you're looking to intentionally create a silhouette or blow out your background, then you might choose to push the exposure slider even further. But generally, 
A decimal change is all that we should need here. Now, the contrast slider is worth a whole separate tutorial. So I'm going to skip over that one for now. But let me show you one more trick. You can call this quick example a teaser if you want. But there is a much improved feature in this section of Lightroom that can save you a lot of time. The brilliant minds at Adobe know that filling up the tonal scale and then bringing out more detail with the shadows and highlight sliders is something that you're going to do again and again as you work with Lightroom. Well, after a decade, the geniuses at Adobe have trained their AI computer to study how we use these controls on all sorts of images. The results of all that research and machine learning are now coded into the auto button that lives right up here at the top of the tone section in the basic panel. When I tap on this button, Lightroom Classic will make its best guess at how these sliders should be positioned for me based on the thousands of similar images that Adobe Supercomputer has studied. When it works well, like it did here, the instant results of the auto button are pretty fantastic. I'm going to tap on the backslash key on my keyboard for a second so that you can see a before and after view of this image without splitting the screen. That's the before, before we'd masked with any of the sliders. This is after. That's pretty amazing. I think that Adobe's auto algorithm did a really good job here, but there's nothing stopping me from adjusting any of these sliders further at this point. In this image, for example, I'll probably push the shadows up a little bit further to bring out even more foreground detail. I might make some other small tweaks too, but all in all, the new auto button did a pretty good job here at setting the tone the way I want. Well, there you go. I encourage you to use this new auto feature as a huge time saver, but don't expect perfect results every time. In my opinion, it's always worth trying the auto button to see if you like what it does and then refine each of these sliders yourself if needed. I don't know if you noticed it too, but I intentionally called this video tutorial Exposure Part 1 because there are a bunch of additional tricks to be learned here for those who want maximum image processing precision. Those advanced skills, though, and a whole lot more about the new auto button are the subject of some of my other tutorials. For now, I hope that you found this introduction to Lightroom's tone or light controls helpful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in our next tutorial.